Hello, I'm Miss Kilburn Bond, and in this video I'm going to help you understand the poem The Prelude, or an extract from The Prelude, by William Wordsworth. So before we start, it would be a really good idea to have your anthology in front of you, or at least a copy of the poem, um, something that you can use to annotate the poem, and obviously you can pause whenever you want to make sure that you're keeping up, go back, revisit things until you're really secure in your understanding. And on that note, the learning objectives for these videos are to try and help you to read and understand the feelings and attitudes expressed by William Wordsworth in the Stealing the Boat extract from the poem The Prelude. That's assessment objective one. Then we're going to look at trying to support you in analysing the effect of language, form and structure in a poem, assessment objective two. And finally, we're going to look at assessment objective three. So that's thinking about context, exploring how contextual factors, including the Romanticism movement, help us to appreciate the poet's intentions and the poem's meaning. So really we're thinking about what can we learn about Wordsworth, our poet? What can we learn about the time that he was writing in that might help us understand what he's trying to say to us the reader in even greater depth. So what you can see on the screen now are some pictures of the Lake District. Some of you might have visited the Lake District on a holiday, a really popular tourist destination because of its natural beauty. So a mountainous area and the Lake District tells you that there are many lakes that you can go and enjoy water sports and scenery. Now Wordsworth is probably the most famous person who comes from the Lake District, you've probably heard the poem Daffodils or heard the line, you know, I wandered lonely as a cloud, and then he describes coming across a crowd of host of golden daffodils, and that comes from the poet that we're going to be looking at in this video. And you can see from those pictures on the screen there, the kind of environment that Wordsworth grew up in and what might have inspired the poem that we're going to be looking at today. So we are here in the Lake District, where Wordsworth grew up. In some sense, it's a solitary place for him, you know. His mother dies when he's eight, his sister sent away, Dorothy, who lived with relatives. And then his father dies when he was 13, you know. In some sense, he's orphaned by nature, so his relationship to nature was always an interesting one. In that sense, nature becomes a companion and a kind of mentor and guide to him, I think, and it almost takes the place of that. It becomes almost a human presence mm. and something that he relates to as if it's a, another human being. And in the poem, nature is personified in, mm. in different ways. And here's a painting of William Wordsworth himself. So let's have a little think about what we can find out about Wordsworth that might help us explore this poem. He lived between 1770 and 1850, and a lot of his childhood was spent in the Lake District. And this poem is inspired by that experience in the Lake District. So the extract we're concentrating on is all about the way he chronicles his spiritual growing up. So not just how he physically grew up there, but what this did for the way that he thought and felt about life generally. He settled back in the Lake District in 1799, having spent some university time, especially in his summers, being quite interested in radical views, visiting France at the time of the revolution, developing a sympathy for the poor, and then moving back to the Lake District where he settled into his sort of later adult life in 1843, actually becoming the Poet Laureate. So he was a very well-respected poet, even in the time that he was writing. And we can't really talk about Wordsworth without understanding this idea, this concept of romanticism, because Wordsworth was one of the first generation of English romantic poets. So, romanticism is a term used to describe developments in literature, art and music in the late 18th and early 19th century. And there are some key ideas about romanticism that are going to help us think about this poem and what Wordsworth is saying to us. So, romantic poets and artists generally would be really interested in focusing on the power of nature, the healing power of the imagination, Revolution absolutely would have influenced any artists at this time because of what was happening around the world, particularly in France. The world of children and the innocence of children being particularly powerful and the lives of people who were marginalised in society. But rather than being really political, critical protest poems, what Romanticism did as a movement was used looking at nature to really express those ideas in a more subtle way, if you like. A romantic poet believed the imagination could enable you to travel 
and transcend beyond your troubles. So they absolutely passionately believed that your imagination was the most precious thing you had in terms of trying to live a life that was better than the physical life you'd been given. They believed that creative talent, they believed that art and music and literature could illuminate and transform your world. So they really believed that humankind generally could be regenerated and could be improved by a love of the arts. And they believed that regeneration would come if we started looking at the innocence of children and we all tried to hold on to that innocent perspective. So one of the ways in which they explored that was through having this sense of awe and magic in the natural world around us. And part of that belief is something that we call the sublime. And this is going to help us understand what happens to Wordsworth in the poem that we're going to read in a moment. So the sublime is a really key idea in romantic poetry. It's a concept and the term conveys the feelings people experience when they see awesome landscapes or find themselves in an extreme situation which elicits both fear and admiration. It can refer to an extraordinary experience that takes us beyond ourselves. So central to the poem that we're looking at is this idea of the sublime. And it would be very easy just to say, oh, this is a poem about a man who gets scared of a mountain. And whilst as a child he is remembering something when as a child he was scared of a mountain and how that mountain made him feel, really as a romantic poet he's writing about the experience of the sublime, that that childhood fear is actually something more complicated than just being frightened. It's also this feeling of awe and being absolutely overwhelmed by the power and extraordinary beauty of nature and how that made him feel. So let's zoom in now then on this particular poem. Now the poem is called The Prelude. We're only looking at a very small extract from the poem because the poem itself is about 8,000 lines long, it's written in 14 sections and it is an autobiographical poem that chronicles a lot of experiences from Wordsworth life. Now the first version was written in 1798 but Wordsworth continued to work on this poem throughout his lifetime which I think tells you how important this poem was to him, constantly revisiting, redrafting it and it was finally published in 1850 shortly after his death. And this quotation from Wordsworth himself is quite interesting to think about. He described this poem, The Prelude, as a poem on the growth of my own mind with contrasting views of man, nature and society. And the extract we're going to look at is absolutely about that idea of an experience that led to Wordsworth growing his own mind, thinking more deeply about his experiences of life. At this point then, we'll just talk a little bit about things that inspired Wordsworth, other writers that inspired him to be the poet that he was. He was a well-educated man and he was inspired by a very classic epic poem called Paradise Lost by John Milton. And that poem is about the fall of Adam and Eve, so the Bible story. Now, John Milton was inspired by other classical poets, so looking back to Homer and the Iliad and really famous ancient stories telling these epic narratives about gods and classical heroes and what happened to them. So what he's done with the prelude is he's taken this historic form, this epic type of poetry that educated people in Britain at the time would be very familiar with, and he's turned that epic story about gods and heroes into stories of his own life. And he borrows techniques from those epic poems to try and take this huge subject of heroes and gods to look at something that's much more small and personal to him, but gives it the status of something that is that important. It elevates those life moments, which Wordsworth actually referred to as spots of time, into something that's much more powerful and impressive. So let's get stuck in to this extract then from the poem. So at this point we're going to listen to a dramatic recording of the poem. Really recommend that you pause after this and you read the poem yourself 
two, three more times because every time you read it, it will feel more familiar to you and your thoughts will start to sort of accept parts of the poem, notice things you didn't see the first time around. So please listen to this dramatic reading, but then keep reading the poem yourself because that really is going to help you with the exploration that we will do afterwards. Extract from the Prelude by William Wordsworth. One summer evening, led by her, I found a little boat tied to a willow tree within a rocky cove, its usual home. Straight I unloosed her chain and, stepping in, pushed from the shore. It was an act of stealth and troubled pleasure, nor without the voice of mountain echoes did my boat move on, leaving behind her still on either side small circles glittering idly in the moon until they melted all into one track of sparkling light. But now, like one who rose, proud of his skill to reach a chosen point with an unswerving line, I fixed my view upon the summit of a craggy ridge, the horizon's utmost boundary. Far above was nothing but the stars and the grey sky. She was an elfin pinnace. Lustily I dipped my oars into the silent lake, and as I rose upon the stroke, my boat went heaving through the water like a swan, when, from behind that craggy steep, till then the horizon's bound, a huge peak, black and huge, as if with voluntary power instinct, upreared its head. I struck and struck again, and growing still in stature, the grim shape towered up between me and the stars, and still, for so it seemed, with purpose of its own, and measured motion like a living thing, strode after me. With trembling oars I turned, and through the silent water stole my way back to the covert of the willow tree. There in her mooring place I left my bark, and through the meadows homeward went, in grave and serious mood. But after I had seen that spectacle, for many days my brain worked with a dim and undetermined sense of unknown modes of being. O'er oh, my thoughts, there hung a darkness, call it solitude or blank desertion. No familiar shapes remained, no pleasant images of trees, of sea or sky, no colours of green fields, but huge and mighty forms that do not live like living men, moved slowly through the mind by day and were a trouble to my dreams. OK, so as we start to go through the poem, you'll notice on each slide in the bottom corner, usually, there's this little sort of book that says literary terms. What you'll see there are just some, some terminology that I might be using when I'm talking about the poem. You don't need to learn these terms off by heart, but obviously it is helpful if you've got this knowledge, if there are techniques that you recognise from other poems that you're able to talk about, then you've got definitions there and you can obviously pause the video if you want to explore those further. So before we start looking at the poem in a chronological order, let's just think about the title. Now this is an unusual poem in that the title doesn't help us with this particular extract particularly, but what we can do here is instead focus on this idea of it being an epic poem, so it being a poem that is lengthy, is a narrative, it tells us a story, and it's written in blank verse, that means it's verse without rhyme. It's also written in iambic pentameter, which it describes the particular sort of rhythm of each line, if you like. And what that does is it gives this poem the feel of somebody who's naturally talking. It's a journey of constant pace and movement rather than a really forced poem that's forced to stick to a particular rhyming pattern. And that makes his voice authentic. It gives us this impression that this is somebody telling us their first person intimate story and it helps us with this sense that his own self and the idea of who he is is important to the poem and the way that that voice develops when he gets frightened, when he's reflective, because the poem's written in blank verse then it enables him to show those shifts in his thoughts. So we immediately then are in this idea of a story being told to us in that first person voice. One summer evening, led by her, I find a little boat tied to a willow tree within a rocky cove, 
its usual home. So this first person storyteller gives us this immediate pastoral setting. So we're immediately somewhere that we know sounds like it's in the countryside, it's somewhere beautiful. One summer evening led by her. Now led by her is nature personified and it's helpful to know that the bit before this extract, so the part of this bigger poem beforehand, is actually describing how nature taught him lessons as he was growing up and so if we had read the start of the, the part of the poem that comes beforehand that would help us understand the her in this poem. So one summer evening led by her, led by this personification of nature. Nature is a maternal figure who's sort of teaching young people through their experiences, is being quite intimate with them and taking them through these experiences. One summer evening led by her, I found a little boat. So we've got this picturesque scene, the boat is tied to a willow tree and the boat symbolises Wordsworth link to the natural world, it's how he's going to go through this spiritual journey. The boat's within a rocky cove, its usual home. The fact that he says, I found, tells us that he wasn't planning to go and find this boat and what happens next is he steals the boat. He's following his natural instincts. So all of these things are setting us up for the story and what happens next. Straight I unloosed her chain and stepping in pushed from the shore. We can tell this is a memory of a child, a young person who's really excited about kind of being eager to get in this boat and is overtaken by this desire to do this sort of naughty thing, if you like, and take the boat. It was an act of stealth and troubled pleasure. Nor without the voice of mountain echoes did my boat move on. So we've got this troubled pleasure image. It's youthful excitement, breaking the laws, the thrill of a childhood adventure, taking the boat that's not really his to take. So, so far in the poem, we've got this atmosphere of something exciting and instinctive and linked to innocence of childhood happening. We've got more personification here, nor without the voice of mountain echoes, with the mountain voices seeming to be building this feeling that it's just him alone with nature surrounding him, nature leading him. Leaving behind her still on either side, small circles glittering idly in the moon until they melted all into one track of sparkling light. So we've got this image now of him rowing the boat in solitude on his own and one thing that Wordsworth and other romantic poets actually talk about is having these visions so being sort of visionary imagining seeing things bigger more magical greater than what actually is there and this links into this idea because as he describes these observations of nature it gives us this idea of the inner state of him as a speaker so the small circles glittering idly gives us this feeling of this being a really serene, idyllic scene. Everything is peaceful and the language reflects that. The language is semantically peaceful. It's magical. The small circles glittering idly, melting into one track of sparkling light. So visually, the imagery that's being created is all something very special and magical. But now, like one who rose, proud of his skill to reach a chosen point with an unswerving line, I fixed my view upon the summit of a craggy ridge, the horizon's utmost boundary. So that word but suggests a little bit of a shift there. So we've got that caesura and we're going into something a little bit different here. But now, like one who rose, proud of his skill. We're now seeing words worth reflecting on the human ability to have pride in being powerful because as he's rowing this boat and remembering that childhood memory of rowing the boat he's feeling proud of his skill he's feeling proud of the power that he has as a human to take that boat and powerfully row it out onto the lake and human pride and trying to show that human pride is often a damaging and negative thing to experience is part of what Wordsworth explores as a romantic poet. So with an unswerving line, again, very proud language showing the strength of him as a rower. I fixed my views of taking control of this situation upon the summit of a craggy ridge. Now, 
we could start to pick up perhaps on a little bit of a mood shift here because a craggy ridge seems quite different to the sparkling light of the lake, quite different to the willow tree in the rocky cove at the beginning. So perhaps there's a little sense of the mood shifting here with the horizon and this craggy ridge representing how nature is eventually going to limit the progress that he's going to be able to make in his boat. Far above was nothing but the stars and the grey sky. It's almost like as a person he's sort of shrinking here and everything about nature is so much bigger than he is. She was an elfin pinnace. Lustily I dipped my oars into the silent lake and as I rose upon the stroke my boat went heaving through the water like a swan. Now an elfin pinnace is the imagery that he's using to describe his boat and it suggests it's like a fairy boat, it's sort of metaphorical, it's capturing that magic of childhood, it's like a fairy tale adventure where even his boat has turned into something metaphorical and that you can also read maybe a sexual reading into this, that this fairy boat is something that's really special and appealing. Lustily, so there we've got that sexual imagery again, I dipped my oars into the silent lake and as I rose upon the stroke, my boat went heaving through the water. So we've got this pride again, he's proud of what he's doing, he is feeling quite excited by his power to get these oars into this lake and to move powerfully through the water, heaving through the water. So a verb there that shows the power that he's got and the control at this point in the poem he thinks he's got in this natural environment. Through the water like a swan. So the simile like a swan suggesting grace, beauty, style, the fact that he's close to nature but he's only ever a human imitating nature because obviously he can never be like a, an actual swan in the water, can only hope to be like the swan. So we now get to the volta in the poem. So the volta means the point in the poem where things shift, where things take a different turn and that's when we see the word when. When from behind that craggy steep till then the horizons bound a huge peak, black and huge, as if with voluntary power instinct, upreared its head. So important that we look at this change in tone and we think about what this means. Previously, this craggy steep had been the highest point on the horizon, and now, as he's rowing towards it, he starts to really see this peak for what it is and it becomes something that as a child is terrifying to him. And what's interesting about the language here is that it's almost like his ability as a speaker to use these beautiful images and to speak with lots of imagery about the beauty of nature is stripped from him and all he can actually say is a huge peak, black and huge, and that repetition of the word huge emphasises that it's almost like he's lost the ability to use a wide range of vocabulary and language to describe this mountain. He's just stuck with the word huge, which only emphasises to us that that is the overwhelming feeling of foreboding that he feels in seeing that. And this mountain now represents to us the full might and power of nature. It's like it's taking offence of him kind of rowing too far and too lustily and has become something that's very threatening and is stopping him making further progress. So there's this definite change in tone. The mountain, the craggy peak, the huge peak is now something that's personified as being aggressive, something that has a will, a purpose of its own and is entirely different to the imagery that we were seeing beforehand. I struck and struck again, and growing still in stature, the grim shape towered up between me and the stars, and still, for so it seemed, with purpose of its own, a measured motion like a living thing strode after me. So, in response to the aggressive, terrifying, huge peak, black and huge, that upreared its head, what Wordsworth remembers doing is striking and striking again and growing still in stature, the grim shape. So we've got lots of foreshadowing again about the power of nature, the mountain peak symbolising nature's independence from the human mind, that the human 
in this poem is dwarfed by the ominous scale of this mountain. It towers up between me and the stars, so it hides the stars, it plunges us into this sense of darkness, if we like, and that later is going to transfer to the idea of Wordsworth's mind being kind of made darker by this experience, this inner experience and how it makes him feel about himself. And hopefully you've noticed as I'm reading that, that there's a repetition of the word and happening a lot here. And this idea that as the journey progresses, he is sort of losing his ability to write in this beautiful, imagery rich way. But instead, the poem becomes quite breathless with pace and he's simply listing all these terrifying things that happened and struck again, and growing still in stature, and the stars, and still for so it seemed, and measured, and it goes on further down the poem, you'll be able to look through and highlight just how many times that word and keeps appearing. And you might have noticed the Caesarea there strode after me, a full stop, before then sort of shifting on to another part of the poem. Everything now, just like the Enchantment one all the way through the poem, has created is about this being a very natural story that's not controlled because Wordsworth in this moment has lost his control and that is being reflected through the way that he's telling this story. There's a shift from the childlike wonder that we saw at the beginning of the poem to a childlike terror and it's almost like nature has become the predator as he describes that it strode after me. So we get this feeling that he is now a sort of victim who is being pursued by something more powerful than he could ever hope to be. With trembling oars I turned and through the silent water stole my way back to the covert of the willow tree. So those trembling oars have clear connotations of fear, the poet as being vulnerable, separated from nature. He's no longer effortlessly gliding and comparing himself to swans and feeling lusty about doing it. Instead, all the symbolism has changed. He's no longer seamless with nature. He's now a victim of nature and is terrified and needing to turn around and try and get away. Through the silent water stole my way back to the covert of the willow tree and there in her mooring place I left my bark. So he's gone from the super confident thief of the boat at the beginning to abandoning the boat which again reflects this absolute life-changing experience that he's having. And through the meadows homeward went in grave and serious mood. So that pastoral imagery at the beginning and how the summer evening and the willow tree and the rocky cove all sounded so safe and beautiful, now it's become somewhere that doesn't feel very peaceful or safe or joyful, but instead has become grave and serious. But after I had seen that spectacle, for many days my brain worked with a dim and undetermined sense of unknown modes of being. So what this poem now does, as we get towards the end of this extract, is starts to explore and reflect on what happened after Wordsworth had returned the boat. And this wasn't just an experience that he quickly forgot. This whole experience then played on his mind and changed the way that he thought. For many days, he describes his brain as working with a dim and undetermined sense of unknown modes of being. So he's talking about not really being able to understand what has happened and how it's made him feel about these forms of existence that he didn't really think about when he first got into that boat. The boat's become a spiritual journey and life has seemed more hostile to him as a result of having taken that boat and then being frightened and needing to return it again. Everything now starts to change to this darker mood. So semantically, the language has connotations of being sinister, being morbid, being melancholy, being sad in tone. And it tells us how his mind is in total conflict. There hung a darkness. So o'er my thoughts, there hung a darkness. Remember, we talked about the imagery of darkness right at the beginning of the poem. And the darkness is in his own mind. The thoughts that are alone, sort of sit alone with himself in his own 
mind are bothering him. He can't let go of what that experience has done to him. Call it solitude or blank desertion. He's not even confident about how to label what's happened to him. No familiar shapes remained. No pleasant images of trees or sea, of sea or sky. No colours of green fields. So we've got more repetition there. Repetition of that word no. No familiar, no pleasant, no colours. And we see now a poet who can only define the natural world by what he doesn't know. At the beginning of the poem, he was very confident about describing the natural world as if he had some control in defining it through language. Now he's unable to do that. He can only define it by what he doesn't understand anymore. He no longer feels like a seamless part of nature. Huge and mighty forms that do not live like living men moved slowly through the mind by day and were a trouble to my dreams. So crowding his thoughts then, we've got these harsh extremes of nature that are juxtaposed with the earlier tranquillity, and that shows us this internal conflict. These huge and mighty forms, notice the repetition of huge again from earlier in the poem, this idea that there's something so much bigger than he is, this mysterious entity, perhaps a spiritual force, it's this glimpse of something, sort of a fundamental truth, perhaps, perhaps even a god, but something that's so huge, so powerful, and then so terrifying, because it's made his mind seem so small and limited. It's a re-evaluation at the end of the poem. He thought he knew about nature, but now he's got this very complex and uncertain relationship with it. And hopefully you can see how this is all linking back to that term sublime that we looked through earlier on. Like living men move slowly through the mind by day and were a trouble to my dreams. So even in what should be a restful time at night, Wordsworth remembers not being able to settle. His carefree days of childhood seem to have been snatched from him and the reality of adulthood has arrived, that sense of no longer being able to feel safe at every turn, feel secure in feeling that you understand. It's like a coming of age moment, if you like. In this moment, he feels humility in the face of nature. For nights afterwards, he's kind of haunted by this memory, and he ends the extract by saying, Huge and mighty forms that do not live like living men moved slowly through my mind by day and were the trouble of my dreams. So we get quite a sinister end to the bit of poetry. Um, you might think that that would make it a negative experience, but in fact it doesn't. This is what Wordsworth describes later in the prelude as one of his spots of time. Uh, and the idea of a spot of time is that it's something that happens to you. It might not be life-changing in itself, but it keeps hold of your imagination and it retains its kind of power to impress you years after the event. And Wordsworth believes as an adult that it's those moments and it's from these moments that we can draw hope, consolation and um, nourishment, if you like, for things that happen to us in future years. And it's really for that reason that the experience is important, rather than just kind of in and of itself. So we need to think about this in the context of being a power and conflict cluster poem. And we've talked about conflict. We've talked about Wordsworth's internal conflict. We've talked about the conflict between man and nature. We've talked about nature containing a power that humans just can never command or control. We've also talked about pride and how humans feel this pride and feel that they have this power that they can use over things, yet Wordsworth shows us in this poem that actually there are certain things that humans can never really take control of and he ridicules that sense of pride that he felt as a child, that assumption that there was nothing that could be more powerful than him and yet having to learn that that's very much not the case. The story ends with this contrast almost between the way he usually sees nature and the way he comes to see it after this experience with his imagination. Yeah, there's the contrast between the green and pleasant forms and the, the kind of pastoral way that we normally see nature and the more terrifying shapes of the imagination. And I guess it's interesting to think about what those forms might symbolise today with 
even in an environment where we're used to controlling the natural world, we're still being reminded of our scale within it by things like climate change, the impact of more extreme weather. In a sense, we still should feel as small in the face of landscape as Wordsworth did. Of course, we also need to think about how this poem could compare to other poems in the anthology. Now, I'm only going to go through some examples. There are other poems that you could definitely find links with. But just to set you off on a course where you could find those comparisons yourself, we'll just have a look at a few. So let's start with Ozymandias. So we've got Shelley's poem, both poets from the Romantic tradition, both clearly exploring the power of nature and contrasting this to the thoughts and attitudes of humans. And London by Blake, we've then got another poet who's presenting a first person speaker using their observations of a very specific particular scene but then using that to reflect on something much bigger that links to the human condition. Another interesting comparison would be My Last Duchess. So Browning also like Wordsworth shows us humans who've got a very misguided sense of pride and power and abuse that. In Exposure by Owen, whilst they might seem at first really different in terms of their context and experience, actually both poets are exploring this sort of moment of realisation where the speaker has to reflect on how they're actually powerless in a much bigger situation. And in Storm on the Island by Heaney, nature is shown to have the ultimate power in both poems, so that's a nice one if you wanted to focus on the natural world. In Remains by Armitage, both poets explore the impact of a traumatic event on the mind and thought of the speaker. So again, they seem hugely different poems at first reading, but actually there's quite a lot you can do there about memory and trauma and how that might change the future, your sort of growing up experience, if you like. Poppies by Weir. In both poems, there's an emotional memory that continues to have power over human experience. So that sort of passing of time, yet something becoming influential is quite an interesting link. And then in the poem Tissue, Darker, whilst again apparently really different, both poems, if you look at them closely and think about them, are actually exploring ideas about human fragility and our place and purpose in the world. And then finally, I just want to ask you to think about Kamikaze by Garland, because in both poems, we've got nature and memory playing a really important role when we think about how the poets are exploring themes of power and control. So I think you could take that idea and come up with some really nice ideas about how you could compare both of them. And that brings us to the end of this video about the extract from the prior by William Wordsworth. I really hope that it's helped to enforce the learning you'll already have done in the classroom and it will enable you to be able to write with more confidence when you come to writing an essay and comparing it with another poem. Thanks for listening. Bye.